Welcome to Follow Your Joy Podcast, where intuition is the doorway to your wisdom, your genius, and your joy. I'm your host, Marla Diane, and I've been transforming creative entrepreneurs' lives for over 26 years. Through two businesses as a success coach and a business strategist, and prior to that, an entertainment publicist and a talent manager for two decades. It's time to make joy your inner GPS for life and business decisions rather than lean on your logic and reason first. You'll not only be following what is most authentic to you and for you, but you will live the beautiful life that's meant just for you. We'll come to learn that following your joy is a life and a business strategy. Listen in for inspiring entrepreneurial stories and solo casts that illuminate how by trusting your intuition, you'll create a fulfilling result. Want to learn how to access, trust, or up-level your intuition? Join me in the conversation to find out how. Well, hello, my creative friends, and uh, especially those of you that are writers. So listen closely. Um, I have a special surprise for you today. To say I'm excited and delighted to bring you our guest is, yeah, it's kind of an understatement. Um, <laughs> you may have heard of her if you've been in the learning to write novels and screenplays mode, and or if you're a parent of a curious teen girl who loves reading adventure and imagination stories, your daughter could very well be a pretty big fan of this world-renowned young adult author. I won't keep you in suspense much, much longer, but I will mention before I give her a formal introduction is that this highly talented author and writing coach is proudly my niece, <laughs> Jessica Brody. Um, she's my sister's daughter who I have been very engaged in her life since her birth. Um, <laughs> so watching uh, Jessica grow up from, this is my version, um, spunky, super smart, dog loving, always curious young girl who loved dancing to, and maybe still does, Paula Abdul <laughs> uh, songs. And now obviously a Taylor Swift fan, which well, I think she's amazing, to still a super smart and even more curious, driven, highly creative woman with a really great sense of humor has been one of the highlights of my life. Yeah. So, okay. I know I'm biased, but for good reason. <laughs> so here goes uh, Jessica's background and her uh, introduction. She is an excellent novelist, a writing coach, and founder of the online writing school, Writing Mastery Academy. And she's always loved writing. And I'm going to confirm that's just not a good PR thing in her bio. It's true. <laughs> I, I witnessed it. Uh, but it wasn't until years after and 15 books later, that she discovered she loved teaching writing too, right? So now here comes the really good stuff. She's the author of the number one best-selling novel writing guide, and I bet a bunch of you've heard of this, and if not read it and used it, Save the Cat Writes a Novel, and the founder of the online writing school, Writing Mastery Academy, which I just mentioned, Ooh, I'm telling you, you, no high achieving here at all, right? <laughs> the writer, right, right. I love it. Um, and she's also written over 20 novels. It's like every time I, you know, for the last many years, I'm like, okay, which, which book is she writing now? Um, she's written 20 novels for teens, tweens, and adults including The Geography of Lost Things, The Chaos of Standing Still, A Week of Mondays, 52 Reasons to Hate My Father, 
Amelia Gray is Almost Okay, which I am reading right now and having a blast reading it. Um, the Unremembered Trilogy tri tri and the System Divine series, which is a sci-fi reimagining of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, co-written with Joanne Rendell. Ooh, that's a lot. Holy cow. And her books <laughs> have been translated and published in over 20 languages, and several have been optioned for film and television. Yeah, that's my niece. Incredible, right? And she lives with her husband and three dogs in beautiful Portland, um, near Portland, Oregon. So welcome to your aunt's podcast. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> Although great sense of humor now puts a lot of pressure on me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be funny. Turn it on, Jessica. Be funny. <laughs> well, you have a you have a dry sense of humor, so it's 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 good. It's very welcomed here. Please go ahead. So yeah, welcome, welcome. Okay, so yeah, let's start with you sharing um, just highlights of your journey. You know how you got to be this you know young girl with dreams of being you know a writer and you know, you created it, you did it, man, it's here, it's live, and it's been live and well for many years, obviously. What and what do you attribute this, you know, remarkable success to? Uh, great question. I, well, so I wanted to be a writer since I was about seven years old. And I don't know if you remember this, but I used to yeah. self-publish my own books with really? like wallpaper wrapped around cardboard <laughs> and secured with electrical tape. And it was yeah, quite the DIY project or DIY yeah. project. No, <laughs> DIY. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, so I used to do that. And then I would put the books on my shelf and be like, look, it's a real book next to all the other books. <laughs> um, but then I think somewhere along the way, I, as often happens, that childhood dream got kind of overshadowed by this idea of adulthood and you need a real job and writing books is not a real job. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, of course it is, but I didn't know that at the time. And so I think um, I got in my head that I needed to do something a little more serious with my life. And I ended up majoring in economics and going on to be a financial analyst. Um Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but I just really wasn't, I wasn't loving it. I wasn't happy. I was writing on the side. Um, and then I got laid off from my job and it was sort of a wake up call. And I always interpreted it as the universe giving me a sign. Like you said, you want it. You said you wanted to write full time. You didn't think you had enough money. Here's a severance package. Go write your book. Um, and I did, and I, I ended up selling that, that book was my first book I, I sold and I've been writing ever since. So yeah. in terms of what attributes to the success, you know, it, it's just, in my mind, it was just constant, constant dedication mm -hmm. and just not giving up. And I know that sounds so cliche and cheesy, but you know, I was rejected over a hundred times by different literary agents. And I just, but I knew that writing it 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 lit me up inside and and it, there was very few things in the world that did that and so i just kept going at it until i i kept rewriting my book rewriting it um and then until i finally got an agent and got it sold see everybody follow your joy follow yes. your joy and i didn't even plan that i, I yeah. forgot that, that was the title of your podcast so there you go <laughs> well I, it's okay i look for that as i'm listening right so, and I know that, especially, you know, knowing your story, but I let, I know there'll be a, a, a good time in her story that it's really going to prove it's, you know, it is a life and, and a business strategy is that when we do, when we follow our joy, it is, success leaves clues. It just mm -hmm. does. And I really, you know, I admire you for your, you know, perseverance to keep going. I mean, come on, everybody, a, a, a hundred rejections, right? <laughs> Pat is someone that's very dedicated. So that's amazing. Um, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that specific, you know, fact, but I, I have physically seen you just, it's like, 
writing and writing. And I was like, when do you ever do anything else but write? <laughs> oh my God, it's like amazing. So, um, and, and add in there too, Jessica, share with, you know, the listeners about, which is similar to what happened to me. You know, I went to Florence and have this month long stay of eat, pray, love transformation. <laughs> you know, you did something similar in Paris. I did. Um, so I, I actually studied French since middle school. So I've always loved the language. I've always loved the culture. Um, Paris is one of my favorite cities. And I studied abroad there my junior year of college. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I got laid off from my job and I wanted to focus on writing my novel, I should say that just to back up a little bit, mm-hmm. when I got laid off from my job, I was working at a movie studio as a financial analyst. My boss went to another movie studio and offered me a job working for him again, and I turned it down. And it was one of it was a huge leap of faith. And I remember my my dad thought I was crazy. He said he said, "Why don't you take the job and keep writing on the side?" And I said, "No, I have to." I have to take this shot. I have to see if I can do this and prove that I, that I I'm really meant to, to do this. And one thing, and I will get back to the Paris thing, but one thing that kind of goes along with this follow your joy theme is that for me, it was never about the money. And I think that was a big thing. Like the, I actually heard a quote that was like, do what you love and the money will come later. And when I was not obviously I needed to make money and I wanted to make money doing what I loved, but that wasn't the primary driver for me. Um, and, and it was proof that like, it took me, I think after, even after selling my first novel, it took me like five years to build up to the point where I was making the same amount of money I was at my old financial analyst job. So just many, many years of writing successfully selling books and actually being published without even making the same amount. Yeah. So that just an addendum to the, to that. Yeah, um, sure. But when you are, when you are doing something you love, it doesn't matter quite as much, uh, at least in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So um, when I lost my job or got laid off, um, yeah, I would decided I'm going to go write this novel. And there was just sort of a, this was kind of the whimsical side of me was like, oh, why don't I write it in Paris? <laughs> because I can, you know, I don't have, um, yeah. I don't have a job here anymore. So I just went to Paris for a month and I rented an apartment and I wrote every day and it was sort of, yeah, I kind of, you know, channeled my inner Hemingway with uh, maybe a little bit less drinking, but <laughs> <laughs> I love the, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's wonderful. You know, and again, I mean, I love this. I have to give it a shot. You know, it's, and that's also, you know, again, part of the theme of my, you know, podcast. And I love all the stories that come out of it, which is you're following your intuition, right? It is, and those two go together is that it's intuition, not logic. I mean, logic would have told you like dad, you know, get a job and do it part time. That's logic. That's practicality. It's like, uh, uh-uh. no, that's just not going to fly. Right. In the face of intuition, mm-hmm. right? and intuition is our overriding guidance system that we really do need to honor, you know, because when we listen and see if you obviously agree with this and obviously your life proves this is that it will, when we listen to our intuition, we will always be led to the next level. We will always be led to what's meant for us, right? It's, it'll never do us wrong. And that's the challenge I find with many people needing support in, you know, fault of anyone's that, oh God, I knew I should have listened to my intuition or, you know, I can, how do you listen to that intuition, that type of thing? So you're a beautiful example of not only following your joy, but literally listening to your intuition and taking that leap of faith Mm -hmm. and look where you are today. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. Really, really good example of that. So, okay, good. Um, So what brings you, speaking of joy, what brings you joy in your work and what you're doing as this, you know, international author? Well, 
I sort of feel like I wear two hats and I live these two lives because I, I write my own novels and then I teach others how to write novels. So there's sort of writer Jessica and teacher Jessica. I think writer Jessica, the the, the most joy I get is really from the readers, um, and particularly as I my first two novels were for adults and then I started writing for teens. And then I also now write for younger kids, uh, like eight, 10, 10 to 12 year olds. Um, and there is no greater joy than a fan, a handwritten fan letter from a 10 year old girl yeah. that's written in pencil on yeah. like, you know, old school lined paper that I haven't seen <laughs> since I was in 10 years old. Um, and the, the fan letters from the younger readers are just so charming and genuine and fill, you know and I love my favorite is when they say here's what I loved about your book here's where I think you can improve oh and, um it's so adorable and I you know and I listen because these are who I'm writing for so if you want something different you know if you want me to change the way I write a little bit I will listen and I will take that feedback um sure. but it's just you know you can tell that they put so much heart and so much um, effort into it. I try. I try to write back as many as much as I can. It doesn't always happen because I get um, I get busy and I get a lot of of, of letters. But um, it's mm -hmm. the honestly the biggest joy. Um, and then you know that is obviously the, the, similar to when I go to a book book signing and somebody comes up to me and says, or even a parent comes up to me and says, my kid hated to read until they found your book. I mean that's mm -hmm. that's pretty. A pretty amazing feeling yeah. um and then teacher jessica i just love love seeing or hearing about the light bulbs that go off when mm -hmm. people are trying to what we say break their story meaning just figure it out mm -hmm. and there's a moment for me at least in every story where i hit a wall it's not coming together something's not right something's not working and a lot of people give up at those moments and they happen in every book. I'm, I'm convinced they happen to everyone in every book. Um, and then there's a moment where if you keep at it or you let it at least percolate in the back of your mind and you let it do its thing, um, you let inspiration happen or creativity happen, even if it's um, kind of happening in the background, there's a moment where you get these light bulbs or you look at something a different way or a piece will fall into place and you'll say, I know how to make it work. And helping other people come to those moments is so rewarding. And um, when I used to do more in-person things before the pandemic, um, I would be able to see those moments in person, which was really great. And now I, I hear about it through through emails or um, tweets or whatever, and it's yeah. just as rewarding, but that, that's my favorite part. Oh, is there any one in particular, you know, obviously without naming names, is there any student story of yours that matches that? Yeah, actually, I wrote about it in my book, Save the Cat Writes the Novel, because it, it left me, it was so impactful for me, I, I wanted to share it with other writers as just a moment of when you, I always say you turn the kaleidoscope just a little bit and the whole image changes that that's mm -hmm. how I kind of view these moments of uh, these aha moments is sometimes it's just a tiny shift. Um, so I put it in the book and then what's I'll, I'll tell you the, the story in a minute, but the yeah. what's really cool is I put it in the book and then I get a lot of emails about that story saying that story inspired them to have this a similar epiphany. Um, so that's been really rewarding. It's like the story that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. um, but basically mm -hmm. I was teaching um, novel plot, plotting in mm -hmm. um, in-person class. And one of the first things we do when we sit down is we figure out who is the hero of the story, who is, you know, we can call it the main character, I call it the hero. Um, and the the one thing I urge people is to say, who has the most to gain or lose or change from this story? Um, and it might not be the person you think it is. You might think you know who your hero is, but then you realize there's this other character who might benefit more from this story or might be challenged more from this story. And so... I, there was a there was a student in the class, a writer in the class who came in with their idea. They knew who the the, the character was, and um, I kind of did my same like, "Are you sure?" And I challenged everyone like, "Is that the person who changes the most?" And suddenly, just a light bulb went off, and she went, "Oh my god, it's this other person!" And her whole story fell into place. Um, 
<laughs> and it was such a great moment. And I, sh- I have a little more detail in, in, in the book, but um, mm-hmm. it was such a great moment. And then I've had other people email me saying, I read that story in your book and I realized that I had the wrong main character too. Aww. So it's fun. Yeah. Well, and, and what I'm hearing between both of these, you know, being the, the um, novelist and then the teacher, and especially for the kids, you know, for the young ones, I mean, remember what it was like, you know, when you were younger and you had, you know, these, if you will, idols that you looked up to or, and they actually validated you or they did what, I mean, those are defining moments. Those are defining moments. So the impact overall that you're offering with your talent, through your talent, what I call, which everyone knows about my specialty in, in, identifying your zone of genius. I mean, you're one of your, or I should say one of your talents in your zone of genius obviously is writing, but it's the impact, right? Mm. It's the impact that you're making on these, you know, whatever, whomever it is in the, in their specialty. So that's awesome. I love that. Great story. Thank you. Thank you. Really great story. So, okay. Speaking of stories is then share with us, um, and you've already kind of shared one thing, but here's here's another, and that is where you followed your, you know, intuition. And I know there's many of these that led to what I call a joyful, fulfilling result. I had this idea many, many years ago. I love. I love reading retellings. I've read a lot of retellings. They're some of my favorites because you get this little piece of the familiar and then you get to really kind of go on a journey with the author of how did they take what we all know and twist it. And I I love that. So I've always wanted to write a retelling. I got this idea years ago to do a retelling of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Um, I didn't read the book until later, but I was obsessed with the musical when I was a teenager. and I wanted to retell it in space. I had this idea to to put it on a distant planet and have like Jean Valjean be basically on the run from a prison moon. And I had all these cool ideas, but I did not have the confidence to tell it. I did not have the confidence to write it. And I thought, you know, I'm not like a I'm not like a literature person. I who's going to take me seriously? This is a great work of literature, and I I I just can't do it. Um, So I sort of put it on the back burner for a long time. And then I was having dinner with a friend of mine, um, one of my best friends, and we started talking about the French Revolution, you know, as one does at dinner, Um, (laughs) and how we both were like really obsessed with with French history. And then she said... um, She said, yeah, I just finished rereading Les Miserables, and it's my favorite book. And... I I didn't know this about her, even though I'd known her for years. And just out of my mouth said, I just went, do you want to retell it with me in space? (laughs) Um, And she was a writer as well. So that made sense. And she just went, yes, I do. (laughs) Um, And it was this moment of like pure, pure inspiration, pure um, Mm -hmm. synchronicity. And we went home from dinner. She was staying with me. We went home from dinner and we just started brainstorming. Like things Mm -hmm. were just flowing out of us. I think we have the earliest recordings because we record all our brainstorms. Yeah. And we were just like, and then this, and then this, and then this. Oh my gosh. Um, And it turned out to be one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever worked on because I got to write something with my best friend. I'd never co-written before. And Mm -hmm. she brought the thing that I felt like I was lacking, like I can do plot and I can do sci-fi world building, but I didn't feel confident with the literature aspect of retelling a classic. Well, my friend has a PhD in English literature, even though this is French literature. um, And she's, you know, she's a, she's an academic. And so she brought this sort of academic side to it. I brought my novel plotting YA side Mm -hmm. and we wrote this space opera trilogy um, we ended up selling it to Simon and Schuster mm. and um, the third book came out, I guess now two years ago. And so it's finished, but it was just so fun. And wow. it, it all came from that one little spark of a moment. Oh my gosh. I mean, we're talking, this is the, you said the trilogy, right? Yeah, it was a trilogy. Yeah. And it was long. <laughs> I was going to say, this is not a book. This is three books. Oh my three gosh. Books yeah. That I mean, we wrote. I- together and mm-hmm. two of them 
we wrote during the pandemic because uh, oh, we also, I live on the West coast. She lives on the East coast. So we wrote the whole thing pretty much over uh, oh, Skype right. and zoom. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. So you got to share, I mean, just something that really, I mean, that's a, that's an undertaking to say the least, <laughs> you know, I mean, a really creative undertaking that, you know, it's like kudos to you. Because I do remember when the first, you know, series came, the first book came out. I remember that. I went, just got two more of these to go. I mean, this is not a small book, guy. Yeah, they're right? doorstops for sure. They're, they're doorstops. These are big books, you know. But yeah, is there um, a, an interesting, you know, experience you had while in the middle of, of this with her that is worthy of sharing? Oh, my gosh. I feel like there were so many. Yeah. Um Mm-hmm. There, we just had so much fun. We, we would always joke that it was like someone was play, someone was paying us to play dolls because it <laughs> felt like we were adults playing with our own little dollhouse. Like, well, it was a planet, it was yeah. a solar, it was a whole distant solar system, but you know, we had like our little characters and like, oh, let's have them get together. And like, let's have them have a fight. And it, sure. if plotting it kind of felt like that, we felt like we were playing and then we would go and like write it. And um, so I guess one one part that we, one part of the story that we just, we always look back at and we always go, remember this was so fun. It was, we were working on the second book, which which gave us a lot of trouble as second mm. books and trilogies are known to do. Mm. Um, it's the middle book, but we, we decided to go on a retreat together where we were gonna leave both of our houses and go meet somewhere and have like a week where we just locked ourselves up and worked on the book. So we rented an Airbnb in Texas and um, this this little house and we we had such a blast. We were literally playing house in a house that we were <laughs> renting. Um, and we had, I mean, it was in the midst of a, of a lot of turmoil in the plot like we were trying to make a lot of things work but all I remember is just laughing and having so much fun and we would walk we would take these long walks throughout the neighborhood and we would walk in these long loops and we would record everything um and we would just talk out the plot over and over and over and there was we were so stuck on this one part and I can't even remember what part it is now but we just kept going around in circles going, well, what about this? And what about this? Oh no, now we're back to the beginning. And we realized that we were walking the same loop over and over and we were <laughs> plotting in circles. So we were like, wait a minute. It's because we keep doing the same, literally we're walking the same loop and we're plotting the same loop. So we decided let's go to a new part of the neighborhood, change up our loop. <laughs> and we broke through the the challenge. Oh, <laughs> so it was like our environment crazy. was affecting the Oh my planet. gosh. That's very you no, know, that's very interesting. Like, no, we gotta pivot. You know, it's like yeah. pivot, pivot pivot away so that it changes our way of thinking, you know. Yeah. We just had we just had so many, so many fun moments um throughout the process. I mean, it was a I think a five year process from the time we had the idea to the time the last book came out. Last book, yeah. It was definitely a long, a long process, but it it's really um, enjoyable to hear that you actually enjoyed it, that you, that you had fun doing. We it. had fun. Um, mm-hmm. I think it takes a very careful matching of people to make something like that work. Um, oh, yeah. there's a lot of people that I would never write a book with. Um, mm-hmm. she's one of the very few people that I would. And, um, mm. and we're still friends today. So that that's a good Testament. That is a good Testament. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, it's like, you it's the ultimate and you know like imagination you know partnership i mean just me knowing at least the concept of the of the trilogy and then of course the the look the size of the book i'm like that's a lot of imagination to be you know partnering with somebody so you would definitely you would definitely need somebody that's obviously a, a good match because if there's there is room for challenge for sure. Yeah. Wow, love that. See, look at all these behind the scenes stories, you know, <laughs> friends. And it's be for me being a, a writer, and I'm definitely not the writer that Jessica is. I mean, I I write for a living. You know, I haven't written a book yet. Um, but I love writing. It's, it's one of my talents and my genius zone. It's like, just give me something to write and I'll just go away. You know, I'll go in my space and I'm 
undistracted and in my imagination. And it just, it's like a painter with a blank canvas. It just, it just comes out. So it's inspiring to hear, you know, and I'm sure for, for our listeners, the power of, and again, when you're in your zone of genius, you're in your highest place of creativity. It's also, it's also, um, that which you love and can do for long stretches of time without getting bored or frustrated. It's what comes most natural to you. It's usually your highest paid talent. Um, it brings you the most joy. So you're like the poster child for the genius <laughs> and imagination. So this is this is fun listening to this. To kind of, you know, wrap some wrap this up is based on obviously your your vast experience what key advice can you give our creative um you know entrepreneurs and creatives listening so in terms of entrepreneurs i think we covered the creatives i think we covered you know the yeah. the, the the follow your joy but in terms of entrepreneurs i i see a lot of entrepreneurs falling into this trap of not wanting to give away their own secrets of success. Um, and what I mean by that is like, oh, I'm going to teach someone how to do something, but I'm going to hold back a few things because they're mine and I don't want to create my own competition. And I and I hear this kind of fear a lot, which, um, you know, I, I like to urge people to look at it in a different way, um, which is that when you give somebody everything, when you say, here's every step I took, here's every strategy I have, um, and this is this is the steps I took to get to where I am, mm -hmm. not only will they appreciate it all that much more, they will see how much more genuine it is than when you leave certain things out. It will just feel like it's missing something, or they'll feel they'll feel that you're holding something back. Um, not only that, right. but they're never going to do it the same way that you're going to do it. Right. They're never, even if they follow the exact same steps, they're never going to put the same type of creative spin on it, or they're never going to, you know, have the exact same output as you. So it's impossible for you to make your absolute competition. Um, yeah. so it's something that I've, I've, it's a practice that I've done in my developing my online writing courses and my online writing classes and my, and my school yeah. is, and it's something that my students will often give positive feedback on is Jessica shares everything. And I, and I will, and they'll ask me questions and I'll say, yep, this is how I did it. Mm -hmm. And I don't kind of cherry pick and say, well, I'm not going to tell them that one part because right. they might write the same book and, you know, and, okay. and, and so it, it's, I think it's an important thing to note is that when you give everything, so people are so much more appreciative of it and you, mm -hmm. you they will come back for more yeah. versus when you hold back, they will, they will sense that you're holding back. That is such a really a wonderful piece of advice and, and it aligns with the abundant mindset. Exactly. Yeah. The abundant mindset, which you and I've had, you know, dozens of conversations over the years about this, that, you know, it's so vital to come from a place of not only giving, but come from a place of abundance because the opposite, you know, anything regarding competition is all about is, excuse me, born of lack. It's scarcity, born of, it's yeah. scarcity and a lack mindset. Like there's not enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not only not, an, there's not only enough for everybody and then some. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're absolutely correct on a practical level. No one's going to end up creating exactly what you've done. You can't because we're all on our own journey. We're all have our own talents. We have our own, you know, specialties and, and assets and, and you name it, qualities and values. So, yeah, beautiful, abundant mindset. That's that'll do it. And you're right. The response is always going to be um positive because they receive that as you know someone that is empathetic somebody that cares somebody that is authentic humble all that so good on you I like that <laughs> <It's> awesome <laughs> all right good so where can um people get in touch with you and what would you like to offer them 
So jessicabrody.com is a great place to go um, to get information about my books. Um, yeah. If you're interested in any of my online writing courses, uh, writingmastery.com is where they all live. Okay. And um, yeah, if, if you're, if you actually, if you go to jessicabrody.com, you'll see there's a opportunity. If you're interested in reading some of my work, um, you'll see a pop-up that will offer you the first, I think it's 50 pages of one of my books. Um, and you can get that for free and start reading. Um, and then, yeah, I hope you, I hope you enjoy it. Well, good. And I think there's also, and we'll put this in the show notes for sure. Um, I think there's also, you have writing resources and tools. Um, also everybody, um, when you go to her, uh, her website and I'll have that link directly to the writing tips and tools. And I, is it your system divine trilogy? That's the sample of the 50. Yeah, pages? it is oh. the Les Miserables retelling. Oh, yeah. good. See, you can go read what we're talking about. That's I love <laughs> that. Okay. Wonderful. And then on, uh, you know, social media, can... I'm on Twitter at Jessica Brody and Instagram at Jessica Brody. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. And she's pretty, very, very active on Instagram. I typically don't hang out on Twitter, but I assume you're, you're there way more than I am. Um, yeah. Instagram, you'll always find lots of good stuff um, with Jessica and her um, books and classes. And it's just, she's very dedicated to that space. So definitely, you know, go there. So, okay, my dear Jessica, thank you so, so much. Appreciate you being here. And uh, so, you know, friends, these were inspiring examples of what following your joy and listening to your intuition. And you, you know that I believe in this and I aspire for you to please pay attention to those feelings. Again, there it's to me, it's success leaves clues. Really, you know, heed that, that advice and those feelings. And, um, you know, they're meant to evolve you. They're meant to bring you closer to manifesting your dreams and desires. Don't hesitate. Doesn't matter if it doesn't feel logical. It doesn't matter if it's not practical. <laughs> like, Jessica, like Jessica, you know, shared with you. It's like she had to do it. She had to not take that other job. She had to go to Paris. She had to make, give it a chance. Uh, you know, like give this dream, if you will, a chance to be birthed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for having me on. This was really fun yeah. and, and, and kind of surreal. <laughs> yeah, no. right? I, do I do podcast interviews a lot, never with my aunt. So I know. <laughs> I know. And you're the first family I've had on my podcast. So that makes two of us, right? <laughs> That's so cool. I love it. So yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone. And uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. Take care. Thanks for listening in. You can find more entrepreneurial stories and resources at MarlaDiane.com. And while you're there, enjoy my three free downloads to uplevel your business and your life. How about you take a screenshot of this episode and tag me on Instagram by sharing your highlights of what you learned today. I'd love to connect there with you. Until next episode, take care.